Hi y'all. In this video we're going to talk a little bit about some law enforcement stuff. Now I know that for the last, well I don't know, two years or so I've been doing a lot of videos talking about the politic, uh, politics of the day, political issues of the day, and lately it's been kind of boring me. Not because of you people or my talking about it, it's just that like it, it really boils down to just a, another iteration of, oh here's the media, they have found that the president has the Twitter account and that's going to be the news cycle today. President Trump typed out 238 characters instead of 240. What could this possibly mean? So anyway, uh, I'm trying to diversify uh, by getting back to some of the stuff I used to do, talking about law enforcement issues. Uh, if you recall, I used to do cases, uh, I'm sorry, cases, videos where I would talk about uh, various police shootings, police involved shootings. Um, I did a, a couple videos a few months back about four individuals who were using a porn business as a proxy for committing sexual assaults, recording these incidents, and then selling those with the blurb at the front, uh, the, this is purely a work of fiction, these people are actors, when in fact they were not uh, actors. By, I mean, they did have some actors, but some of them, most of them weren't. And uh, as I mentioned, um, three of the cases were stale by the time I caught wise to it. One of them was still ongoing. That guy is now in jail. He's awaiting uh, trial. And uh, two of the others are in prison, and one was murdered by one of the men he sexually assaulted. The moral of the story there is, guys, I guess, if you have like a thing, a fetish for very strong, very athletic, very muscular, large black guys, um, you should probably try to devise a different way to meet one or two than to set them up for something and then uh, sexually assault them and you know kind of try to exploit them into just cooperating in the future uh, because apparently they can fuck you up. The, the one guy was bludgeoned to death by one of the guys he had, uh, one of the, the men he had molested. So, uh, you know. Lesson learned, not for him, I guess. But anyway, so I'd like to you know do some of that. And if you guys have suggestions for things you want to talk about, by all means, uh, email me, Twitter me, leave in the comments. I do read them. If it's something I'm interested in, I'll talk about it. If it's not, I won't. If I don't know anything about it, I probably won't talk about it all that much. But anyway, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Chris Watts. If you'll recall, he is the husband who murdered his pregnant wife, their two daughters, and then disposed of their bodies in these large oil building type things, uh, silos, I don't know what the hell they are. Uh, very large uh, petroleum containing barrel of some type as where he stuffed their, their bodies. So um, there is a guy, I ran across a video by a guy named Derek or uh, Van Shake. I hope that's right. Derek Van Shake. I hope I'm getting your name out there correctly, sir. And he is a body language expert. Trademark. Um, academics, please respond. So, and he does motivational stuff and whatever, and I watched a couple minutes of this insufferable video, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but this guy is, and he makes money doing this, uh, telling people all these, these fantasies about um, investigations and how you can tell this from the, that, it's just all bullshit, but we'll get into that. Um, I've done videos on, as I mentioned, police shootings. A lot of times people will accuse me of being in the bag for the cops because I'm an ex-cop and, you know, obviously, once a pig, always a pig. It isn't that. It's just that they're, the people who disagree with me, by and large, are having a different conversation than the one I'm having. They're having a conversation about, I don't think that this is right. I don't like this outcome. And I'm having the conversation, what does the law require? These are not the same things. Law and ethics are not the same issue. Law and morality are not the same things. The question, the, the question fundamentally that the legal system is trying to answer is, was this conduct justified? Not was it wise? Was it good? Should it have gone that way? Could it have been done better? Is the officer perfectly more? It's none of those types of questions. It is, what is it that the law requires uh, of a person in their conduct? And then, you know, you answer that and you're either on one side of that ish, uh, outcome or you're on the other side of it and, you know, you do what you can. You get a, you get a, a lot of this kind of a fundamental misread about the law from the media people on their part is largely intentional because they're actually educated uh, but some of them are just stupid and it, it is uh, Supreme Court sides with X you know when they uh, fail to when they don't take a case Supreme Court sides against so-and-so when they issue a temporary uh, order of some type that halts a lower proceeding it, it, it isn't that at all uh, and every justice, I think every sitting justice, with the except, exception of the past two, uh, who were just recently uh, confirmed, 
I think every one of them has talked about it, and it's been in multiple Supreme Court opinions, uh, because it's not just journalists who should know better, but seem to forget themselves who do this. It's also lawyers who definitely should know better, but uh, for whatever reason they refuse to accept reality. And even lower court judges who need to be put in their place from time to time uh, and be reminded that they need to stop trying to divine what it could possibly mean when the Supreme Court fails to take a case. It means absolutely nothing other than the fact they get, thousand, they get nearly 10,000 cases per year. They're going to listen to about 70. Virtually all they say is, deny, 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 deny. They do that all day. Uh, you know, 10,000 you know, 10, cases per year. Most of them are important issues, but they're not sufficiently important for the Supreme Court to get involved. Um, I, think, uh, I think Antonin Scalia was talking about this. It could have been someone else. He could have been telling someone else's story. Uh, I don't really remember. I guess I should have looked it up, but I didn't. But anyway, it is just a fundamental misread of what goes on. People will have this question about that the, the court is taking a side in the actual issue rather than deciding how the issue should come out based on you know the neutral principles of law to the extent that they can divine them. And he says what should happen is every time a judge gets uh, confirmed in the federal system or elected or confirmed, appointed, whatever it is in the state system, uh, money should be taken out of the treasury to buy them like this $50 stamp. And uh, you know when a litigant comes in wanting to complain about the constitutionality of some law or other, they don't like like drug laws. I don't like the fact that it's illegal to smoke pot, which you may be a perfectly fine policy argument, but it's a completely irrelevant legal argument. Uh, and so they'll file this, uh, they'll file some complaint against the law to try to challenge it in some weird interpretation of the Constitution, whatever. And, uh, you know, they lose. But the case comes in, the judge, should, you know, what he should do is read the petition, read the motions, the lodgings, pleadings, whatever is, you know, put there to make the initial decision. And then instead of writing these lengthy opinions, what he should do is just sit on the bench and pull out that big old st big stamp with the red ink and go, whack! Stupid but constitutional. Whack. Stupid but constitutional. Whack. Stupid but constitutional. Because that's what they're saying uh, in a lot of the cases. Is that, Look, this law is absolutely idiotic, but it is a validly enacted bit of idiocy, and it has to stand. It, it does not offend the Constitution. Go away! It's just because they're doing two different things. So People are talking about their policy preferences. Oh, I wish the world would come out this way, or oh, I wish the world was like this rather than, you know, what is it that the law is trying to do? So, there's, there's that. Um, and I'm, I, I kind of like the idea of, what? stupid but constitutional. We should, we should do that. So anyway, uh, here on YouTube, this Derek guy is not the only one, that, uh, this is particular about his, the, the Chris Watts case. There are other people who do this body language nonsense, um, and they come up with these confabulations about how to discern if someone is lying, how to read people. Um, the I, I haven't watched all the videos, so maybe there, some of them out there are good. But there's this one CIA lady. She's a former CIA officer, which is used to bolster her uh, seminar costs, <laughs> how much she can charge you. And I'm like, I know how to spot a, a liar fairly easily. Go to one of your seminars and pay money, is what you should say. For those of you who paid money, uh, congratulations. Here's how you spot a liar. You just paid money for someone to tell you that they can uh, teach you in an hour how to notice subtle little signs and behavior that will just reveal the inner souls of other people. Now, obviously this works well. Uh, law enforcement are trained this way. CIA officials are trained this way, which is why they have such an abysmally high um, <laughs> divorce rate because they're completely unable to tell when their partners are cheating on them and lying to them about it. They're that well trained. It's just modern day uh, phrenology. Uh, polygraph, this CIA officer. Um, polygraphs are out and out bullshit. Now, they have utility, but not for the reasons people want to, polygraphers like to say, or a lot of people like to think. The utility is not in their actual ability to discern truth from falsity. The utility is in that people believe that they're able to discern truth from falsity. And therefore, when the polygrapher, after the interview, says, well, you know, a suspicious little wiggle here, and that means blah, 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 you know, people are like, oh, I'm caught, and they'll confess. So it has utility in that sense, but not because it, it works on its, in its own right. A, uh, a manufactured confession from someone's alleged co-conspirator can produce that result. Uh, you know, you can produce it in a lot of different ways. It doesn't mean that the manufactured confession or the claim that, well, right now your partner is over there in the other room confessing, so you better be the first one to finish it out if you want the best deal from the DA. There's no confession going on. It's just a ruse, but it works because they're like, oh, shit, it, you know, I, I want the deal. I, I don't, I'm getting ratted out. I'm going to go first. That's why it works, not because the confession that isn't being written is a true retelling 
of the events. It's not even been written. It's completely manufactured. That's polygraphy. Now, um, this CIA officer lady that they're uh, that I'm talking about had this. She has this you know, how to spot a liar, how to catch a liar, whatever the hell it is. And it's like bolstering her credo. Uh, I'm sorry, her credibility, her bona fides because CIA official, trained polygrapher, interview, blah blah blah. Um, one of the problems with this is if you hear that someone was a CIA interrogator or anything of the like, it's complete nonsense. They don't have interrogators. Uh, they have no school for it. They have no training for it. It's beyond their competence. It's why they uh, resorted to waterboarding people because they're pathetic at doing interrogations. It's not what they do. So being incompetent, they said, I know. Here's what we should do. Let's torture people. Which, as anyone who knows anything about it will tell you, that's also a bad technique. Uh, yes, you will get some true statements. <laughs> but they will tell you anything to make you stop torturing them. That, anyway, whatever. So, uh, if you don't believe me, you can go look on the CIA website. Uh, no job positions for CIA interrogator. Inter they don't exist. So, they have in-house polygraphers who interview uh, for, the, uh, for the hiring process. These people typically do not have a law enforcement background. They go to a polygraph school where their heads are filled with all kinds of mumbo-jumbo. It's probably, I'm sure there's enthusiastic coming out as people were from learning how to do phrenology and, and uh, you know, how Miss Cleo was when she first learned how to lie, I mean, how to read tarot cards. It's very interesting, I'm sure. It's complete nonsense. They learn uh, tool, tools like FAINT, the Forensic Assessment Interview Technique, or the, uh, the Morgan Interview Theme Technique. This one's really wonderful. You, you have people write a work of fiction to tell if they're making things up. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Oh, wow, I just spat. Uh, I, I am not the one who conjured this into existence. It, it is what the technique is. You give them some pictures and, and ask them to tell you stories about the pictures on the uh, assumption that when people tell you stories that they're making up, they're actually telling you largely the truth. On the uh, forensic assessment inter uh, interrogation tool, interview tool, sorry, technique, they... Uh, they claim that for certain kinds of interviews, if you follow their accredited method, you can get 100% accuracy. I'm like, wow, that is fantastic. Why are there any unsolved crimes? <laughs> because it's an out and out uh, lie. There is nothing to this. It is all smoke and mirrors, which is why it's not admissible in court because it meets no criteria by which something is said to be a, a credible investigative technique, uh, a reliable investigative technique. G flipping a coin is about as accurate as a polygraph. We don't let people flip coins uh, and then go into court and testify about what the coin flipping... Well, when I flipped it and he said he didn't murder his wife and they landed heads, that told me clearly his aura was instructing me that it's wrong. And then when I got four heads in a row, I knew this is the man. Complete nonsense. So this Derek guy wants to read the body language of Chris Watts um, when the, the day the police were called to his house by a friend of the family. And the, uh, the story at the, the events of the day were that this woman had gotten, woman well, had not, this friend had not heard from her friend, the, the now we know to be murdered wife. Uh, who had a doctor's appointment and was pregnant and had not returned from it. And so that's what sets it off. That's why the police are called. And can you just check, make sure she's okay? And so the officer figures out that he can't open the garage from the little keypad because it's not working or the garage doesn't work, whatever it is. Uh, he talks to the neighbors. They didn't see, hear anything, see anything fishy, blah, blah, blah. So there's nothing really alarming that, that's gone on. In fact, there's nothing alarming at all. Uh, but this guy, Derek, likes to analyze things. And I use analyze in the loosest possible sense. It's barely an English word anymore once he's finished his uh, analysis on it, because it gets fucked over pretty bad. So <clears throat> there are a number of fallacies that uh, interlap, uh, interlock in these kinds of analyses. And, one of the things, for those of you who don't know, I'm a mathematician. Logic is very interesting to me. Uh, but I'm not really interested in the high, in the high level, you know, break new ground. I'm really interested in just understanding failures of reasoning, you know, failures to think things through and the, the problems that, that arise from our, you know, this meat computer in our, 
or heads that doesn't actually crunch numbers all that well and uh, has to work really hard to do things well um, until it's trained. And if it's not trained, you're going to get a lot of really slapdash kind of outcomes. So, one of the big fallacies that, that arises with these body language readers is, this, is what's, it, it is so old and so well known and it was so prevalent, it has a formal name now, or a technical name now. It's called the psychologist's fallacy because of where it arose. It is in the uh, complete incompetence of psychologists of, of old to distinguish what they think about what a person is thinking and what the person is actually thinking. So they would confuse their own views for and their motivations for the, those of their patient. Uh, so that, that was brought into existence. That's one of the problems this guy has. Another one is, well, there are two, the historical fallacy and the historian's fallacy, but, but what, the names don't really matter. So it is, the uh, historian's fallacy is trying to judge the actions of people in history based on values of the modern day, understandings of the world of the modern day, and knowledge of the modern day. Mo knowledge of, you know, that we have right now. The people in the past did not know what we know. Uh, they, you know, different time, different level of knowledge, different level of understanding. It is invalid to try to project that onto your subject and, uh, and then say, well, you know, it, it, essentially what they're saying, if we could time travel and just plop someone from the 21st century into the 11th century, how would they act? And that was the motivation of the people in the 11th century. It is, it is just not true. Well, is that your lie detector, kitty? No, I just got a shocker. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm not hurting the cat. Um, so anyway, uh, it is just not valid to do that under any circumstances. You have to base these decisions off of what was known to the people who were operating in, the, in whatever it was, the events that you're interested in, at the time they were involved in them. Uh, this is also one of the things that uh, people fail to understand in the police shooting videos I do. The questions that you ask have to be confined to what did the police officer know and believe at the moment he acted. Now, they say, oh, you know, that works to the cop's advantage. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. For example, if you shoot someone who turns out, who happens to be armed, uh, in a, you find that out later, that he happened to be armed, but you did not reasonably believe it to be true at the time or did not know it to be true at the time, you don't get any, uh, any uh, bonus points for that. You still get arrested and charged for the killing because you did not believe, you did not reasonably you know, think that the person was armed and dangerous at the time you took action. It is not going to help you one bit that later on it turns out that that guy you shot just has, just, whew, that was a shooting gone good, guys, lucky me. No, you don't get any bonus points. You have to make the decisions based on facts uh, known to the officer or should have been known to the officer at the time it happened. This is the difference between a subjective and an objective analysis in the law. A subjective analysis in the law is you try to to figure out what in fact did a person feel, what did they know, what did they believe. Uh, but on use of force issues, that's not the question. It's not a subjective analysis, it's an objective analysis, which you say, put this officer off to the side. Same thing with uh, arrests, probable cause. Uh, but the officer's a racist, that may be true, but you don't get away with the crime because the officer is also is a, is a morally terrible person. The only question for the law is, was there uh, some objective facts which when viewed by a reasonable person would be understood to constitute or uh, satisfy the probable cause requirements for a stop and arrest uh, for the violation of whatever statute it is. And that's, that's the question. Not, uh, you know, a racist can pull you over for having a broken taillight, but the, the question that the criminal courts are going to ask is, did the officer have good grounds for believing your taillight was broken when he pulled you over? Not, and in addition to that, was he a racist? Because the, in addition to that, was he a racist? is not an excuse for the infraction. It might give you a lawsuit against the officer personally, uh, where you can take his house, whatever, you know, fine, go for it. But you, you don't get a not guilty in the criminal court or the traffic court uh, because you can win uh, for the bad actions of the officer, the bad motive of the officer later on. Two separate issues. And it's important to distinguish this. So you have to make the basis, you have to make your analysis based on what was known or what would be known to a hypothetically reasonable and competent observer, uh, you know, at the time that the events uh, unfolded. This guy, Shake, whatever his name is, is not competent in any way. So what happens is uh, they get on the phone, they talk to this Chris guy, and he says, uh, I'm on my way to the house, I'll be there in about five minutes. And then this, the two friends who had come over because they're worried about the woman, you know, the, the, now that we know to be dead wife, 
said, well, you know, he said that, uh, we called him a little while ago, and he said he'll be here in about five minutes, you know. And the officer's like, it's not really generating any controversy for him. Uh, so in the second phone call, he says, yeah, I'm about five minutes away. You know, look, it's traffic. Any number of reasons could explain that. But uh, no, of course, the shake guy goes, he's trying to delay, which we now know to be, you know, that he probably was, oh, I don't want to be there because the cops and I you know, murder my whole family. This could not, this might not turn out entirely great. But that's not something the officer is going to be thinking about. Uh, or it's not something that a reasonable officer would be thinking about. What this officer is thinking about, I have no idea. I can't, I can't project what I would do into his mind, but I can tell you what his training would, would uh, tell him to do. And most officers do, in fact, follow the training. Uh, so there are a number of facts that officers, any officer, even the not enter entirely competent ones, will know. And it is that there are about a little under a million missing cases filed every year. Reports of missing persons filed every year. 850,000, 900,000, something like that. Lots and lots and lots of them. Virtually all of them are resolved within a few minutes after the phone call and certainly within hours. It's only about 5%, which is still a large number, 5%, 10%, still a large raw number, but you know, out of the total number, it's not, you know, well, it's only a small percentage. Uh, turn out to be something more than that. The person has legitimately gone missing. And of that set, uh, you know, out of all of that, about 1 in 10,000 winds up in a homicide. Very, very low probability. Um, one of the reasons that it used to be the case that law enforcement would require people to wait 24 to 72 hours before they would take a missing persons report from them is precisely because of that. Uh, because most of these will resolve themselves in a few minutes, a few hours. Uh, if we just do nothing, the great bulk, bulk of these will take care of themselves. But the problem there is that you have a rare event of high impact. So it, low risk, but high impact when it happens, when it's actual kidnapping. Uh, particularly by a person who has more motive than just kidnapping for like ransom or it, you can hide a witness or something like a really you know, evil-hearted kind of person and the reason the problem there is that if they mean this person harm set, three quarters of the, of the people kidnapped roughly are killed within the first three hours of the kidnapping so if you're not on it right on the outset three quarters of the people you're looking for are going to be murdered so you need to you need to respond quickly uh, about 85%, 80, 90, something like that percent, are dead within the first day. So that's why we now take those in law enforcement very seriously. Let me answer everyone. It says nothing at all to an officer when you get it there and the you know the mother comes out, the father comes out, the neighbor comes out, the best whoever comes out and says, My whoever would never do this. You hear it all the time. And then lo and behold, what happens? Turns out your loved one would do that. And they will tell you this. These people will tell the operators this. They'll tell the officers when they arrive on the scene this. Uh, they would never do it. And you get back and you pull up like, any previous uh, issues with that house or that address or whatever. And you'll see like a sheet a mile long of just this event. It, it, they, they develop like this kind of, I don't know, cop amnesia. They forget they've ever talked to them before. And it's like, ooh. Anyway, cops here day in, day out. So you just, okay, I, I understand. Don't want to get into that. I understand. And then you do your job, your cop stuff, which is about observation and making notes. So Chris Watts pulls up and gets out of his truck, comes around, opens the passenger door, gets something out, I don't know what, and the shake guy pauses the video and says, this cop is probably wondering now, or is, is like, why is this guy not sprinting to the garage door? Well, you know, it's like eight feet for one, so the cop's not going to think that. And two, there's nothing unusual about a person following their ordinary routine in a moment of stress. Uh, very many people behave in stress the way they would behave uh, every other day because we are creatures of habit. So for all of this officer knows, the guy, he, he is a laborer, he has work clothes and home clothes and he keeps home clothes, stu home stuff and home clothes and work stuff and work clothes. So he could be getting his keys out of a pair of jeans in the back. You have no idea at that moment what is going on. And more importantly, the guy, the officer has seen this guy for not even eight seconds yet. And he's not screaming, I'm a murderer, I'm a murderer, waving a gun or throwing Molotov cocktails or anything you know, weird. He walks over and opens his door. Uh, I've talked about this before when doing interrogations or interviews, as we like to call them, because it sounds nicer. Um, you want to establish, you want to calibrate uh, the baseline of how this person behaves. So what a competent officer, competent criminal investigator, in this officer's position, 
uh, should have been doing is noting baseline. We have an incident that, that has stress involved with it. Wife gone missing, possibly. Wife overdue, certainly. Uh, whereabouts unknown. He's calm. He's cool. He's collected. He's carrying on. All right. So this is a baseline. This is, all right, this is how this guy behaves under mild to moderate stress. Okay, cool. I'll just note that for future reference and see what happens. The guy goes in. Anyway, whatever. And so um, it goes through this and he starts talking about, oh, and look at the officer because of the way his uh, body cam is. He, his hand shows up, you know, like that a lot over the body cam. He's like, he's probably got, he's got his hand on his head. I don't know exactly where, but if he's doing this, it means that. If he's doing the other, if he's, this means decision, this means thought. Yes, because they're cartoon characters, and people go, I have decided. <laughs> Wait, I'm contemplating. I'm formulating a plan. Now I'm thinking. Control my mustache a little. And now, I'm going to be decisive. Yes, now is the time. It's just nonsense. Uh, if you want to be a good criminal investigator, and catch criminals and develop a good way to catch criminals. I can tell you there is a secret to it. It has nothing, well, I mean, the big secret to, to this secret is data uh, crunched into information that you commit, that you master. If you want to know if someone is lying to you, you need to know what's true. That, that's the way. It is the only reliable way to separate lies uh, from truth. And note, I said reliable way. There were obviously really bad liars, you know, like, well, uh, there was this Judge Judy episode, not that I talk about. I, I'll talk about Judge Judy. And uh, the case is over in like, you know, 10, 15 seconds because the guy inadvertently confesses to having done the thing that he said he would, didn't do. You get those kinds of people. He says, no, that thing that was, she says I stole her purse, uh, it was missing when I took the purse. You know, oh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I, I have a decision ready for the ruling. Stupid but constitutional. And uh, guilty. Yeah. So anyway, there's that. Uh, you're not going to get it from these microfacial expressions and, uh, you know, is the person closed off? You're not looking for uh, body posture. What you're looking for is, is not simply what a person says. I mean, you're looking for that, but you're looking for how does it change when, they, when they're stressed versus not stressed? How does it scale with stress? Are there unusual speaking patterns about certain parts of things you're questioning about, but uh, a, a different kind of pattern for other things that you're talking about? It, it, we're, it's like um, our, you know, the way our ears work. I guess I shouldn't say what. Actually, yeah. Right now, we are traveling thousands of miles an hour. And if you stand here and close your eyes, you are perfectly ignorant of it. We are really bad at noticing states in, in, in isolation. We look for changes in states over time. And that's what you're doing as a criminal investigator. You're looking at what, a, you know, obviously you have to listen to the words coming out of a person's mouth and compare that against what you know. But you're listening, you're listening to what they say, but you're paying attention to what they do. And this is where the body language people go off the rails. Yes, you have to, it's important to pay attention to what people are doing. How are they telling it? You know, is, is it, are there unnecessary delays? Is, you, there are things you can look for, uh, but they, they, these things, when you see them, actually do not imply dishonesty. They imply stress or distress. Um, and that, when you see it, is an indication to you that you should come back to that issue or maybe pursue it now, depending on you know, whether you want to let the story be told un uninterrupted, you know, however you conduct your interviews. Um, but that's something you want to remember, to make a note of, to come back to, because they stammered over. I stammered a minute ago, not because I'm lying, but because, you know, we don't walk around in our ordinary, everyday lives with script writers and editors who make it flawless when we speak, and they take out all of our uhs and ahs and other verbal pauses. I don't take those out because, as I've said many times, I want my videos to be something like what you would get if you came over to the house and we were sitting down having... Uh, coffee or something. I want it to be on that kind of level. These aren't speeches. I don't write scripts. This is. Uh, I don't do a great deal of uh, research on things because most of it I've got in my working memory. But some things I do have to do research on because they're complex and a new study will come out. And I've got to read it. But you know, by and large, uh, this is what you see is just what I can do extemporaneously in any random conversation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm well read. What can I say? 
but you want to notice patterns, deviations from patterns, changes in verb tense, spatial uh, reasoning issues. You want to pay attention to all that. But ultimately, those only indicate where you should focus attention. Focus attention where? On follow-up questions? An important investigative technique. Make sure you get the person a full and fair, give them a full and fair opportunity to tell you their tale, whatever it is. But most importantly, it's for when you go back to the data, the information that you have, and you start looking at it. You should commit large portions of it to memory, so that way you can instantly spot when someone has told you something that's different from what they've previously told someone else, or that is different from something you've, someone else has previously said, or is different from videographic evidence you may have seen from the security cameras, which was used in this case, uh, from an ATM or whatever. And crucially, before you want to rely on those other sources of information, you need to vet them too. Uh, I have seen any number of cases where the investigators have been led astray for simple technical mistakes, like failing to make sure that the clock that's being, the time that is being recorded on this video is the same time as what's being recorded or uh, stamped on this other video. If they're working off two different clocks, the fact that one clock says this and one clock says the other does not imply anything wrong about the person. You just need to make sure that the equipment is properly calibrated and such adjustments as need to be made are made so that way they can be uh, normalized and you can look at it in an appropriate sense. Um, this notion that there is a way that people react to stress is not true. That's this Shakes guy uh, projection, his psychologist's fallacy. Um, that uh, I would behave X, Y, Z way if I heard that one of my loved ones was missing. Therefore, this officer would behave that way. And therefore, he would also believe, as I believe, that that's what a person should do. And uh, therefore, that's how the person would, in fact, act if this were, uh, if he didn't know what was going on, was trying to play it cool. Um, no, you're, you're totally projecting. There is... Some people faint and stress, some people vomit. I mean, I've delivered death notices and I've been puked on. I've, been, I've had people raise their hands at me. You have no idea what to expect. You just have to take it in. Um, we are not kangaroos, where if you see a kangaroo standing around, you know, grooming its paws a lot, you know that that kangaroo is agitated. The anger, that, that kangaroo is distressed because that's how they react. All kangaroos, assuming they're not paralyzed or something, all kangaroos behave that way when they're under distress uh, because it raises their blood temperature and that's how they cool themselves. Humans aren't like that. We have choices. And this guy is a laborer. They are not the people who are prone to, you know, fits of hysteria and, oh my God, something has happened. They're more of the problem solver type. Many of them. It's really hard to generalize here because, you know, basket, category A, category B, and all kinds of variations in between. But a lot of guys, like myself, pride themselves on the fact that in the face of adversity, they don't lose their shit and start running around like a chicken with their head cut off. They realize... Stop with the lie detector, cat. They... It's funny that she, that she does that right as I say. People like me, you know, calm, cool, collect. What? Beam her out, Scotty. Uh, that when some adverse event has happened, that is the time where it is least appropriate to be hysterical. You need to stay clear. You need to stay calm. You need to stay focused. Now, in this case, it, he was doing all that because he wanted, you know, because he just murdered them, which is a good reason to want to appear like you're not, you know, hysterical. Uh, or, you know, you want to make sure that you're very cautious and methodical, calm, cool, collected, uh, so you don't make any stupid mistakes. And, you know, oh, yeah, well, when I was strangling her, oh, shit, how'd you catch me? You know, so there's that. But that is just, that is the same kind of thing that you would expect of a person who behaves that way. Uh, when they're having other kinds of stress, by which I mean it's a reasonable way to act and it does not bespeak any kind of deception, any kind of malfeasance or wrongdoing of any type. It denotes stress. Pay attention to it. Notice how the person reacts. Are they the kind that gets hysterical? Are they the more stoic variety? One of the best examples of the stoic man uh, who I admired since childhood, his name is the Earl of Uxbridge. He was the cavalry commander for the Duke of Wellington at Waterloo, you know, so Blucher, Waterloo, um, Blucher, Wellington, Uxbridge, you know, that group. Napoleon was there too, allegedly. That's what they want you to believe. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. And uh, he was uh, there out fighting, and um, he'd had, I don't know, he'd lost like a dozen or so horses had been killed from under him. So he, I guess, keeps hopping from horse to horse to horse. Well, finally, he gets hit by uh, cannon fire, and it blows his leg off. And he turns to the Duke of Wellington, 
For those who don't know, Dukes are above Earls. He goes, my lord! Oh god, I've lost, my leg has come off! And uh, the Duke of Wellington turns around and goes, so, you know, something along to the effect of, I dare say, it has! And that was it. He didn't scream. You know, the guy's legs just been blown off, and he's like, calm as a cucumber. And when he was, uh, when they had to amputate the rest of it to prevent gain, gain, gain green, uh, you know, he just sat there and he says, Doctor, do tell me when you plan to proceed. So the doctor says, I'd like to proceed now. And he goes, at your pleasure. <laughs> and he sits back and he gets his leg amputated. Yeah, that, that kind of thing. Or like Major Andre uh, for, from the Revolutionary War as a British officer whom we hanged for uh, being a spy. And uh, a British gentleman to the end, when it came time for him to be hanged, uh, he, did, he helped the, his hangman uh, by placing the noose on his head and adjusting it properly to be executed. You know, the, the grace under fire, the coolness in the face of heat, the calm, the order in, in the midst of chaos. A lot of guys aspire to that. It is a creed of their life, and it is absolutely disingenuous and batshit retarded to be talking about the fact that a person is stoic, that that thereby implies they're dishonest or they've done something wrong. And there are no, there is no shortage of people who have been harangued in the past by officers because of this very kind of retardation that we have spent decades training out of police forces, trying to get that bre that breed of mind out of the, the, the law enforcement community because they are fundamentally incompetent. And what you see in these cases is not, at the end of the day, uh, a large proportion of officers saying, and boy, I got it right. What you're saying is, and I learned from that. Yeah, you should have learned it from your training. You should have listened to it when you were trained. It, there's a, um, a fallacy that applies here. It um, goes with this other guy's psycho psychologist fallacy. But it's called an ecological fallacy. It's a failure of reasoning where you think that what is true of a group of people is true of any particular member of the group. That is not a valid way to reason. Uh, it is not proper. Um, the, the fact that some people do this or do that is not, not a license to say that when a person does that, it means this or it means that, or that a failure to do this means the opposite or anything of the like. It just, just note their behaviors and look for things that, that are, uh, stand out from you know, one moment to the next. Uh, you want to gauge it that way. How does it change over time? Are there certain topics or certain ways of approaching, approaching an issue that will make this person you know, go one way or the other? They become more calm, less calm, more excited, less agitated, whatever it is. Uh, a whole host of reasons for this, and it, the most that it can tell you and the most you should use it for is that there's possibly something here that, needs, that requires me to look a little deeper. I'll make a note to do that. Um, there was a murder case, I, uh, I guess it was a year ago now. I was watching a documentary on it, and the, uh, the man, the husband, had nothing to do with the murder. Uh, never cried when his wife went missing. Uh, never interrupted his daily routine. Never stopped working. Never, never gave up anything. Uh, was never emotional. Didn't react. And the officer said, and that told me that there was something suspicious. Well, as it turns out, the guy is just very stoic. He's not emotional. And that officer wasted a lot of time and money chasing around the shadow, the boogeyman of his own incompetence. Meanwhile, the whole while, the real abductor and murderer of this woman is running free because the lead investigator is fundamentally incompetent and should have been fired. Uh, but he wasn't fired, he wasn't competent, and an investigation went on for a great deal of time looking at the wrong person, precisely because of this stupidity like, uh, I'm sure you know, if the eye goes up and to the left, it means they're accessing this or they're uh, that's an auditory memory or visual memory, what, I, it's, all, it's bullshit, it's all bullshit. There is absolutely nothing there at all, period. Uh, you know, get Miss Cleo to read your tarot cards, the same, uh, it sounds exactly the same to me. If I were ever under, you know, there's some crime that happened and the police wanted to talk to me and they wanted to polygraph me, I would laugh at them. I didn't laugh at them when I was applying for the job because, you know, I wanted to get the job, so I play their silly little game to you know, sit down and essentially look at goat entrails, which is precisely what they're, that is what they're doing. So, um, I had to stop watching this guy because he was really getting on my nerves. It, it, this, just this complete inability to reason things out, or maybe he knows better and he's dishonest. I don't actually, I don't know the guy. Uh, you know, once again, can't tell if he's lying or just stupid, but there's something that's not right there and it's something to be looked into further, so 
you know, that's why I paid attention. Um, not going to project onto him. If he's, I, I don't know if he's stupid or dishonest. I'll, I, I guess I'll just go with stupid because it sounds friendlier. But th these fairy tales that people tell themselves and convince themselves or knowledge, just they, they amuse me by uh, to a large extent. Uh, I find it really sad in a lot of ways, but funny in a lot of ways, too. So, this CIA lady, I'll talk about her a little bit, with the, the faint training, forensic assessment interview tool, the look at the picture and make up a work of fiction from which we're going to try to divine the truth about your life. Oh, you've got a bump over here. I guess that means... Oh, it's an ingrown hair. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bone. My bad. It, it's crazy. <clears throat> um, if you get a... When you go to a law enforcement agency, um, a lot the, the people who... I don't want to generalize here because there are exceptions to this all over the place, but in a lot of cases, the person who is doing the polygraph, the polygrapher, is himself a commissioned officer, uh, trained law enforcement. So they're trained investigators, uh, they're trained criminal investigators before they go to a polygraph school. In their hands, you get something different. They're going to get in the hands of somebody who took this 18-week course and that's all they know about interviewing, uh, which is you know to play these stupid little mind games, believing all the while you're doing something useful, while you know they spectacularly fail to catch spies. Um, they, they caught all these things with these experts at the CIA caught exactly zero of, of the important spies uh, that I know about. And I know about quite a few. Uh, complete. The most it can do uh, is serve as a people um, who are applying to think, well, I don't really want to go through this because I've got something to hide and know that it comes out. And so it discourages some of those people. Uh, it has utility there, but in terms of actually sussing out the truth in and of it, by some mechanism, no, not, not really. So, um, you get it in that kind of hand, and you get a lot of delusion going on, whereas if you have a, an honest polygrapher, a person who's, they realize that what the utility here is not in the squiggles on the, the page, it's that the person believes the squiggles on the page means something, like they believe you can look in the goat entrails and, and the gods are speaking to you, and you're going to be victorious in battle, and blah, 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 blah. They can do a lot with it, but they could do a lot without it. What I'm saying is that it's just one extra ruse that in the hands of a master interviewer can be useful. That's not what you're going to get, uh, by and large, from these, these polygraph people who go to these independent accredited institutes. Uh, you know, you get a person who doesn't do law enforcement, they're not practiced at this, they have their little games that they play and they think they're doing good work, and they write up these really self-congratulatory articles where they make nonsensical claims, like I mentioned the, the faint, uh, if properly followed, has a near, or I, the paper actually said, what appears to be a 100% detection rate for falsity. Really? That's fan-fucking-tastic. I'll take two. Anyway, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And other than uh, that, I guess I'll see you guys later. Happy New Year.